In part two, we're going to look at the fingerprints of God and the changes in the formation of the earth and development of the earliest life forms. We're going to find identifiable creator fingerprints in what we call the dynamic DNA, the oxygen-producing jolly green chloroplast in plants, and the mighty mitochondria who have produced all of the energy in every living thing on earth, and finally, God's spark of life. Without that, nothing lives. Now in part one, we learned how the earth had to be created by our nebula to include the 94 essential elements and put them in our Earth specifically. We learned that an asteroid delivered the extra water and carbon needed for life on Earth. We know that the planet had to cool its surface and melt the ice to form the land and the seas. Now in part two we're going to look at how, where oxygen came from. How did we get oxygen into the atmosphere? How was that created? We're going to learn how a genetic DNA code was made, was created to make stuff and reproduce. Now we're going to also learn how the, what the early life forms looked like. And, and they were created all virtually out of nothing, just out of the primordial soup within the sea. And, of course, we'll always look at the spark of life because that had to be included. And only you know how God has done that step. Now the Earth... Earth's land remained molten for billions of years, down to 541 million years, when the creatures in the seas finally were able to live on land. And they started to, particularly the plants, began to come on the land and at the same time create all the oxygen. And we're going to look at all that, how that happened. Now, the next step is absolutely astounding. It, it, it should qualify as a creative event, but it's not quite to that level. We'll just leave it as a miracle alert. The Earth was formed 4.6 billion years ago. So from 13.8 billion years down to 4.6, we have that gap before the Earth was formed. But it was a little short of carbon and water. And what happened about 100 million years after it was formed which is about 4 billion years, or 4.5, it got hit by a large asteroid that was one-third the size of the Earth. So a huge asteroid hit it, and this asteroid happened to, happened to contain carbon and ice as water. And it hits the outer surface, and there we add all the extra water and all the carbon we need to have life and to have oceans and enough water everywhere. At the same time this happened, we formed the moon because of the a collision that knocked off a piece and it became our moon. You have to ask yourself, <laughs> can this be coincidence? It couldn't have happened without, it, we would not have life if it didn't happen. Is this coincidence or is this by design? Um, I know what my choice is. It, this is just too much to be a random event. The way the earth developed was in layers. So it has a dense core in the middle of iron it has a molten level or layer around it, which is heated by nuclear fission of uranium in here, which keeps the center part of the Earth warm. Then there's this mantle. Now, the mantle is mostly rock, and at the upper portion of the mantle is kind of a slippery layer. It's called the asthenosphere. It's very, very slippery. And it, it abuts the continental and ocean oceanic crust. So this is parts under the ocean and this is the very crust where you see uh, most of the earth with uh, in the very very top is the uh, is the top soil. The lakes are in here but underneath the lakes is this crust. Now the trouble is these work together and it slips over this and what it creates the squishy layer is like molten tar and the earth the surface of it slips and these are called tectonic plates and so the earth, the solid part of the earth, initially is going to begin with one block of land and it will break up over time to make the continents as we know today. So this is slippering slippage caused by these tectonic plates and that's where it happens, right at this junction. On the last slide we really focused on the slippage of the land masses at the junction of the upper mantle and the crust. And this, this slippage allows along, along this line creates the tectonic plates, which over time have gone from one big block of land to all the continents we have today. But now on this slide, we want to focus on the center portion. Here's the iron core. The iron core is important because it's magnetized by the sun. 
and therefore creates a magnetic field around it, which helps avoid getting hit by too many asteroids. Now next to it is a molten layer, which is undergoes nuclear fission, as we mentioned, with uranium as the primary user, and this creates immense amount of heat. Now this heat heats the center of the Earth, and the sun heats the top of the Earth, and that keeps the temperature of the Earth in a habitable temperature. So we're at a habitable distance, and we're at a habitable tem uh, temperature for most of the planet, except the polar areas, and it's a little cold. In between is the solid stone mantle, and of course the other portions we talked about earlier. This is what it looks like. These now we're looking at the, the Earth crust, the continental crust and the uh, suboceanic crust are all underneath the water and, under and underneath the land masses. And originally they were all stuck together. And this is thing a, at this time that the land masses are called Pangaea. And this took years and years to start to separate. And these are the tectonic plates. And we are still, mo they're still moving today. And they, when they move and they bump into each other, we get the the tidal waves and the tsunamis caused by this contraction and on Earth we start getting earthquakes. Now just a word about the Earth's crust. If you look at a cliff any place you can see the topsoil is very very thin. That's the part where we're using. That's the dirt where we grow things. Underneath that you get rock. The densest rock is in the, is in the deep portions. That's granite and the, the upper rock tends to be more sandstone. The lightest rock is a volcanic rock, and that gets jetted out by the volcanoes, which we talked about in earlier lectures. So this very thin topsoil is where we have to support all the plant life. The total Earth crust is about five to six miles, so you're going to go down five to six miles, and then you're going to hit the hard mantle. Now this is of interest because everybody likes volcanoes and are curious about them, and they start it's a hot spot next to the nuclear, the molten layer at the bottom. It just sends heat through here enough to melt things. And as it does, this molten rock gets molten, comes up to the surface, then blows out the top, taking a whole lot of this material. That's, of course, it's all molten. It's, it was hard, hard as rock, and now it's molten because of this center core heat. And we see it then as it bursts out, and it comes out with fire and lava flow. And the lava flow creates this material that goes over the surface of the earth which is really the lightest material and is mixes in with the soil and it's very useful for plants. Now the first thing we're going to look at is the formation of the earth. When did it start? It started 4.6 billion years ago and of course it's a planet so it's but it's still molten, it's still on fire but it happens to exist relative to the sun at what we call the habitable zone. So just the right distance from the sun. Not too close, not too far, but it's pretty hot. So along the way it starts to cool and the early atmosphere forms but it doesn't have any oxygen in it. Then the land and seas form. Fortunately we're bombarded by the asteroid Thea that brought carbon and water which we know were necessary and that hit about four, four billion years ago. Then along about three billion or two and a half billion, you start getting the very earliest life forms, which are called archaea and bacteria. Now both of these still exist today. The archaea are found in the ocean, in the hydrothermal vents, and the bacteria we know are on land because we can get strep throat and we get infections. They're still, they're still around. But most bacteria are very helpful. For instance, we have it in our gut to digest food. And they... Uh, so, but they began quite early. Then the earth continued to cool, the land and seas formed, and uh, but the land was all in one big blob. And uh, later it'll pull apart to make the continents like we know today. So the early life forms came about two and a half billion years ago, but at one billion years, another miracle happened, and they developed what we call eukaryocytes. Now, that's a funny word, but just think of the U as you, Y-O-U. So it's your, and karyocyte means cells. So these are your cells, and these are cells that are going to be able to use oxygen. Along the way, some of these early bacteria started to form oxygen, but all of a sudden, when you have eukaryocytes, they're going to go on to make animals and plants, and we're going to talk about all that.
So that is 1 billion years ago. Then, between there and 541 million years, so we've gone from billion down to millions, the Earth is going to develop oxygen in the atmosphere, and the eukaryocytes start to go. In, into they derive into animals and plants, and the planets start to creep up on the Earth beginning at 541 years. And that's the transition to what we call the Cambrian Eon. So that it's called a Cambrian Explosion. So out of the blue, all of a sudden the animals and plants start to develop on Earth. And we'll follow that timeline. Now before we move on, I'm going to show you a little analogy. We're going to compare a living cell and what it needs to a cell phone. So if we begin with the cell, it has to have an outer case. It has what we call a cell membrane, and it's pretty smart. It has to have holes in it that can let only good stuff in and gets rid of debris going out. So it, it's pretty smart. It isn't just a hole in the wall. Now we compare that to the cell phone, and it has a case, and it has holes in it all over the place to let certain functions happen. Now these turn to be, out to be buttons, but these turn out to be nutrients. Then inside our cell, we have to have a nucleus, and the nucleus has to have DNA. The DNA is the instruction manual for all the processes the cell has to do. It has to make proteins to do all kinds of things. It has to have enzymes and proteins to make structures. For it. it has to build a cytoskeleton inside of it. So the DNA is the instruction manual. That's sort of the brains of the outfit. And, of course, you come over to the cell phone, and there is the computer. The computer is exactly the same. It has instructions for the entire phone to work. Now, the next thing is inside the cell are little organelles, they're called. And these are called mitochondria. And the mitochondria is the energy source, and it has to be rechargeable all of the time. So the mitochondria matches the battery. This is a rechargeable battery, and these are rechargeable mitochondria that make energy make everything work. It allows everything to work. So it's the energy processor. This is the energy processor, just like your cell phone. Now, in, in plants, we act one more thing, and that's called the chloroplast. It's a big word, but it's got chlorophyll in it. And guess what color the plants are because of the chloroplast and the chlorophyll? They're green. And it's green for a purpose because of the chlorophyll. So the chloro is the chloropla and the plast is what makes it. So there's a chlorine maker. And what this does is take sunlight and carbon dioxide in the air and it makes oxygen. We're going to talk about that. And that's equivalent basically to the function buttons. So the cell phone has an outer coat. It has an energy source. It's got an instruction manual. And it's got special devices to do certain things. And that is equivalent to our cell wall, our nucleus with the DNA, the mitochondria, which have their own DNA, by the way. They have DNA in here, and they have DNA here. And this comes from your mom. The, but these are maternal origin DNA. And the same with the chloroplasts. Now, we're going to look at the Earth's life timeline. And we want to see what are the very earliest creatures, and they're called archaea and bacteria. They're very simple organisms. They were formed in the sea. They were not on land. This happened somewhere between 2 and 3 billion years ago, and they were the first creatures. And they appeared out of nowhere. So there's no preceding living creatures. There's only the elements floating around in the sea, and mostly rock and still molten rock on the land. No vegetation, no animals, no nothing. So the very first animal appears. Now you have to ask yourself, how can that happen? Because it's a tough environment, there is no oxygen, and the early life needed to have this outside capsule right here. It seems simple enough, but where do you get it? It's not in the water. You had to have made it. Interesting. And it had to have holes in it, channels, so let good stuff in and bad stuff out. It had to wait inside that cell. It had to produce energy. And it, so it had to ingest stuff to make the energy out of, which included nitrogen. And these bacteria were able to create 
take oxygen, uh, nitrogen out of the water and convert it into usable nitrogen to make primitive DNA. So there was some single-stranded DNA. And where does that come from? They had to have a plan to live, to grow, and to reproduce. All of this was happening in a toxic environment. So the question is, how could this have happened just randomly? It's just absolutely impossible. So the logical answer is that it had to have been created. And that's what we believe is true. Now as we continue down the timeline, we get from 3 billion down to 2 billion years, and you start getting a change in the bacteria. And they start to develop chlorophyll. Now why they dreamed this up, I don't really know. And there's no good explanation, nobody knows, they did. And now they were called cyanobacteria, and they could start making oxygen. Now, what do they look like? Well, these were bacteria that weren't actually in the water. All the others were in the water, but now these grew up onto the land, and they look like blue-green algae. It looks just like algae. And the, the rocks they were on were called strombolites. They're still here today. You can find them in certain parts of the world. So they're still around. But the question is, why would these bacteria want to make chlorophyll, dream it up, and why did they dream it up? Who knows? To make oxygen, since they didn't need it. They are anaerobic. They didn't use oxygen. So the answer, this makes absolutely no sense unless down the road some other creation, millions and billions of years later, would want to use oxygen, like us. This can only be part of the Creator's visionary plan. Two billion years ago, the process starts to give us oxygen and change the atmosphere. Now this is a graph, and it shows you what the atmosphere looked like and what it contained way back at four billion years earlier. It had a little bit of carbon dioxide, it had a modest amount of water, had a lot of nitrogen, and it had a whole lot of methane and ammonia, both of which are quite toxic. So it starts that way, and then down around this 2.5 to 2 billion air years, you start making oxygen from these type of bacteria called cyanobacteria. You don't have to know the name. It just starts to do it. And the oxygen level starts to increase. So now we're going to see the oxygen increase. But it's not going to increase a great deal until we get the eukaryocyte plants. We talked about that happening. And the eukaryocyte plants have chloroplasts. And now you can manufacture oxygen very well. You get a lot of oxygen. And pretty soon the oxygen level gets up to 21%. Now over time it varies up and down and that causes some extinctions that happen. We'll talk about that also. But you can see the oxygen from the eukaryocytes, remember your, your cells, your cells in the, in the form of plants, makes the oxygen. And so it really builds up to a lot at about 500 million years. And at that point all the plants start coming on the land and, and later, the animals will develop, and we'll show you how that happens. Now, we move along Earth's timeline, down to one of the more important events, and that's the formation of eukaryocytes. Now, karyocyte means cells, and you means a good cell, but it also you can translate it as to your, your cells, because this is where we all came from. The other cells were primitive, but right about a billion years, you had these formation of the eukaryocyte cells. This is a huge creative event, as big as the Big Bang, because all of a sudden you were able to take this simple comp simple DNA that they had before. It was a single-stranded DNA. Now you could make double-stranded DNA, put it in a nucleus, and develop a mitochondria, which is a little organelle that makes energy. This is your this is the engine for every cell, every cell you have in your body. You have to use this, and it has to have its oxygen driven. So it has it's an oxygen metabolism. And also it made chloroplasts. Now you realize that both the mitochondria and the nucleus and the chloroplasts had to generate all new DNA. These are long chains of, as we've talked about before, long chains of proteins that are able to be used as a template. In other words, it's the instruction manual for everything in the cell to do. So out of the blue, we had to create two new kinds of DNA in the mitochondria and the chloroplasts and go from a single strand to a double strand of DNA in the nucleus. These are incredibly complex events.
and how it can happen in a toxic soup of the primordial sea is beyond any question. Uh, it's just totally unreasonable if it's random. It has to be a creative event. So once you've done that, now we're going to be able to have one form that will have the nucleus, mitochondria, and the chloroplast, and they're going to become plants. And the others will be the nucleus and the mitochondria. They'll drop the chloroplast. Remember, anything green, so every green leaf, whatever, has the chloroplast. It's not, a, it's not complex. If it's green, it's got the chloroplast. And so the others are the, so that we can make plants and we can make animals. And once this happens, at about a billion years, and you get down to 541 million years, all of a sudden you have what was called the Cambrian explosion, where all of a sudden we're going to unfold all of the living creatures on Earth right at that point. Now this is our list of the seven major creative events. We talked about the first three in part one, which was the Big Bang, where everything came from nothing. Out of nothing came a whole lot of stuff and a whole lot of energy. There's no explanation. That's a creative event. The supernova, when the, the big stars, the first generation stars, uh, implode and then explode, they blast out all of the elements. The 94 essential elements get blasted out of stardust. Now, we didn't need to. Why did it make them? That's a creative event. But the nifty nebula came along and said, I'm going to collect the stardust, and I'm going to make the second generation stars, like the sun, and I'm going to make planets. And at least our planet, which is somewhat of a miracle, ours got the 94 essential elements. You have to have these elements or nothing's going to work. Now we're on to part two. We begin with the dynamic DNA, and then we'll go to chloroplasts and mitochondria and the spark of life. But the DNA is absolutely remarkable. The DNA is the cookbook for a cell. It's made out of these little amino acids, so the cell has to make amino acids, and that's not easy to do. It has to fix up normal dissolved nitrogen and put it in a form that can be formed into a compound. I mean, who, who, does, who, who did that? I mean, it's, it, it happens out of the blue. That's just an impossibility all by itself. Then it has to take these amino acids and some sugar, so an, a sugar backbone, and it makes them, it arranges them in a long chain. Actually, two chains. So the two chains have to be close together, working together. That's absolutely impossible unless there is a creative event happening. And, but we need all of these DNAs to make all the proteins and the enzymes that we need for life. Now here's a picture of a cell. This is the nucleus. It could also be, you have similar things in the mitochondria and in the chloroplast, but they all have DNA. But in the nucleus you have most of it. And this is, of course, the cookbook. So what does it cook up? It has to have a recipe to make the inner and outer cell, cell walls and those membranes. It has to have a recipe to make enzymes to make digestion and metabolism work. It has to have a recipe to allow movement. It has to have a recipe for getting rid of debris. And it has to have a recipe for doing reproduction. It wants to create itself. These are all parts of the DNA in the cell nucleus. And we'll talk about the DNA and the mitochondria on a later slide. It was amazing that early cells could form. These are living cells. Up to that point, you have the earth and then all of the primordial soup, but there's no life itself. And along the way comes the bacteria formation and the archaea formation. But they just sort of get by. But it's a huge advance once you make your cells, the eukaryocytes, your cells. Make sure you remember that. They added the nuclei with DNA, mitochondria with DNA, and some of them will add a chloroplast. Remember it's green because it's got chlorophyll and the plants are all going to be green as well. So what happens? These cells are different than these cells. The eukaryocytes appear out of nowhere. They don't exist from the early cells. They didn't just change over. This is a brand new creation. It has the brand new nucleus, the brand new DNA, and it, ends th it adds these mitochondria, which remember in our analogy are the batteries. So the mitochondria provides all of the energy for everything to work in the cell. That's a big deal. So it's in both the green cells, which are the, pl animal, uh, the plants, and the 
other cells, which are the animals. So they both get mitochondria because they both have to use energy. The eukaryocyte animals are going to use the oxygen that are created by the plants. So the plants add this new thing called a chloroplast, which is able to make oxygen and glucose, sugar, out of carbon dioxide and the sun's energy. Absolutely astounding uh, creation. And from that, you're going to get the oxygen formed and the glucose, both of which are needed by animals. So as this chain makes the oxygen and the glucose, and this chain uses it. When we look back at the seven major creative events, remember the Big Bang, everything from nothing, the supernova when it explodes makes elements up to 94 essential ones, it makes them here, but we're going to need them down here, blows them out of stardust, the Nifty Nebula collects all this debris from the, from the universe, and it spins out a nice star like the sun and a planet like ours. I don't know how many times it does it for other places, but it did it at least for us. And then we talked about the instruction manual, the cookbook for everything in our cells, the DNA, which again came out of, it's just a miracle in itself. It just, why it happened, and it's so complex you just can't even imagine that this happened by random. Now we move on to the jolly green chloroplasts, because they're a major creative event as well, because both the chloroplasts and the mitochondria developed by themselves. There was no, they did not come from changing something else. It's not like it evolved. The, the little cells had something and it got a little bit better. No, this, these, the chloroplasts and the mitochondria are absolute creations unto themselves. And that's why we include them as major creative events. Now, we're going to look and see why chloroplasts are a creative event. Why is this such a major change in life? The answer is it enables the circle of life with changing carbon dioxide into oxygen, which is necessary for the mitochondrial function to have any energy. If this doesn't happen, then we don't exist. They also make glucose, which is a very necessary part of metabolism, especially for the brain. So muscles can use fatty acids and, and fat, and the brain can only use glucose. So if you're going to have a brain, you have to have glucose, and guess what? These eukaryocytes, your cells that made plants, were able to do that. It had used chlorophyll, so they looked green. It took carbon dioxide, it took sunlight, and it turned, went through the chlorophylls, what we call photosynthesis, and out comes glucose and oxygen on the other side. And that's picked up by the eukaryocytic animals. So these eukaryocytes that became animals need this oxygen. They absolutely have to have glucose and they have to have oxygen or everything stops. This truly is a remarkable, it's an absolutely remarkable creative event in God's visionary plan. There's just no other explanation. It just can't happen by random events. Now I showed this graph before. We saw the primitive atmosphere. It was not very nice, full of methane and ammonia, which are very toxic. Didn't have any oxygen, had some water, had a lot of nitrogen. And along the way, the early bacteria, the cyanobacteria, started to make some. But once we made our plants, the you, your cells, your plants, they made oxygen and they made glucose, and poof, we end up with an atmosphere that works for everybody. And this really takes hold at 500 million years ago. And once this happens, then the eukaryocytes, both plants and animals, are going to creep up on the earth and develop over time. We move on now to number six of the major creative events, which development of the mighty mitochondria, the mighty mitochondria. They're mighty because they make energy. Now, to do this, both the chloroplasts and the mitochondria have to have their own DNA. That DNA is different from that in the nucleus, which makes proteins, but these go ahead and make specific structures. These made the uh, chlorophyll, containing components that makes the oxygen, but the mitochondria make energy. And the energy it makes comes from its own DNA, and it has to run day and night, every minute of the day, and it makes the fuel. This makes the fuel that makes all the cells work. And it's called ATP is what it makes. I won't explain what that means, but just ATP, you'll see that around and you get your science classes. ATP is the fuel. It's like gasoline. You can call that ATP gasoline if you want.
It's the energy to make every cell in your body work. If you stop making, if you don't have enough oxygen, then this stops. So we definitely need the oxygen from the chloroplast, shoots into the mitochondria, and we'll look at the mitochondria because it's really quite complex, and I want you to appreciate how complex it is. Now, just to put multicellularity development in perspective, here's a challenge. Go down to the sea, just like the primordial sea, fill up a pail of water and sand, put it on your porch. How many years do you think it would take before a frog hopped out and looked you in the eye just by random chance? In my estimation, that's absolutely impossible without a creative event. Now, let's look at the three major creative events that have happened in part two. And these are the formation of organelles. There are specific organelles. They include the dynamic DNA, which was encapsulated in the nucleus. The jolly green chloroplast, and they had their own capsule. And then the mighty mitochondria. And let's look at what happened. Each of these has a, a organelle has its own DNA and its own specific purpose. It is a very unique purpose. The DNA is the director of everything. This, the DNA decides what is made, what is functioning in the cell, how you get it, how you create it, how you get rid of it, and all the debris, etc., and decides how the cell functions. There is the brains of the outfit, although it's not a brain. Now the jolly green chloroplast had to be developed, so they had DNA and they had the chloroplast. They could make oxygen out of carbon dioxide and also glucose out of carbon dioxide and sunlight. So now the earth and the atmosphere had evidence of growing more and more oxygen. And the chloroplast, of course, evolved into plants. The mitochondria are the energy source. They are the fuel, So they, but they need to have oxygen to function. So this had to come first, and then you had to be able to get the oxygen into the, into the cells, and then into the mitochondria, they can make the ATP, which is the fuel, for existence. Now, when they all work together, that's called symbiosis. And it's incredible, the fine-tuning of the entire world and all of life. Now, think about it. We began with simple cells billions of years earlier. So they, and it wasn't until about 3 billion years you get any cells, and it wasn't until about 1 billion years that you get the eukaryocytes, and it doesn't, you, we get down to 540 million, not billion years, when the eukaryocytes, simple animals, uh, simple little creatures, one cell, decided it was time to make more complex animals and plants. So all of a sudden you have multicellular changes, and then pretty soon you had limbs, and you had lungs, and you had hearts, and you had, and the plants had stems and flowers and all that stuff that happens. And at this same time, some of these plants and animals decided to leave the sea because up to this point it was just everything in the ocean and they moved on to land which is pretty barren at the time until the plants arrived so since these cells had no brain they could not think of anything of all this by themselves it was very unlikely to happen by chance in fact it's impossible in my estimation so we really have to explain it we only have one really good option and that it sure appears that life on earth was clearly designed and created for life. The whole process was created and designed. Now we've finished part two. And what's the main takeaway? I get it. Once you start looking at the world around you, you will keep finding God's fingerprints everywhere. In the next module, part three, we'll examine life on Earth. After the Cambrian period, we'll explain that in a minute, right up to the present.